Dr. El Hiba. Um, Dr. El Hiba is a professor emeritus of, from Purdue University. Dr. Hiba will give presentation on air quality issues at uh, livestock facilities. Dr. Hiba. Thank you very much. This will be a highly humorous uh, discussion, so it'll wake you up a little bit, really. Um, so there are several locations, um, sources of, of air quality issues, air, air emissions, the confinement buildings, the outdoor manure storage and treatment facilities, land application of manure, and even the mortalities. Now, the issues that are associated with these are neighborhood nuisance, animal and human health concerns, and compliance with regulations. Now I have a little diagram here. Um, so the livestock air quality, well, one of the issues is that there's, so, there's multiple pollutants that are emitted. And so let's, let's draw them out. There's odor, we just heard about odor. O odor affects farms large and small and for decades and centuries. Now, hydrogen sulfide and ammonia are toxic gases that are well, we've heard all about them. We're hearing all about them at this conference and uh, won't go into that too much. But then there's the greenhouse gases, the greenhouse gases and, and VOCs. So that's come to the forefront over the recent years. And then dust. Uh, my first project was in 1985. It was assessing dust inside swine buildings. It was the number one research priority for the National Pork Board that year. It was only $8,000, but um, we begged, we borrowed, and we stole on campus to make it work. Um, but some of these particles are biologically active. And so it's a lot different than, say, um, uh, a nuisance dust defined by OSHA. And dust gets all, all over everything. It, it deteriorates equipment. Uh, it affects the way we measure things like relative humidity sensors don't work because of the dust and, and, uh, and it just interferes with a lot of things. Uh, even putting a biofilter on a, uh, to control odor, it, it gets, it plugs up the biofilter or, or scrubbers and, and things like that. It can, and so it's something to deal with. And those gases, they absorb onto the dust particles. So dust particles carry these gases and odor long distances. Now there's one more spot to make it all symmetrical. What am I going to do? Do you know what I should add? Water. Okay. <laughs> Water vapor really messes things up. It makes uh, animals sick if it gets too high. It, it, it uh, causes corrosion. It, it's, it's a pollutant. It, it can be a problem. So it belongs on my little diagram to make it symmetrical. All right. So a large livestock facility in the past have really gotten hit by three waves. The first wave is a citizen odor nuisance suit. And the, neighbor, the, the neighbors will, will seek for actual and punitive damages. They may seek for an injunction to close the operation down. They, they, may want, they may want court orders and they have achieved court orders to make measurements or to uh, abate the odor. In Ohio, right here, there was a nuisance suit by the citizens against Buckeye Egg Farm in 2001. In Missouri, there were there were neighbors who sued Continental Grain and, and uh, uh, Premium Standard Farms later on. And then in North Carolina recently, uh, Murphy Brown got hit by a lot of plaintiffs and that's called the North Carolina Hog Farm Litigation, which was settled just a couple of years ago. And the states can also, um, okay, the states, they have odor regulations and they take the form of indirect regulations, maybe permits, setbacks, operator training and land application uh, restrictions and requirements. And then other states may have direct regulations that where, they, where you actually measure the odor at say at the property line, most often it's at the property line. And 10 states, and in 2000, we saw 10 states in a survey that, that have these. And uh, uh, they may use field olfactometry readings. Several states do that. Some states like Minnesota, they measure the hydrogen sulfide at the property line and it can't exceed 50 ppb more than twice a year. And so I got this from the Minnesota Air Pollution Control Agency and they had measured around a swine lagoon that was, uh, they had gotten complaints from neighbors about it. So they came out and they set up a single point monitor Northwest and Southeast of this large lagoon. And there's 50 ppb and they pegged the meter even uh, at 90 ppb several times. So this was a problem. 
they, the producer had to deal with it and they, and they tried everything. They tried additives and they ended up having to cover the lagoon. And then of course the hydrogen sulfide went away. And they also can, can sue the producer and that's exactly what they've done. State enforcement. So let's go back to those two cases. Premium Standard Farms got sued by, the, by Missouri. They had to pay a fine. They had to shell out a lot of money for next generation technologies. Buckeye Egg Farms got hit by the state and they had to pay a fine. They had to convert their high rise houses to, to belt houses. They, they even got their operating permit uh, revoked in one, in, in one case. I guess that was in 2003. They even closed down a facility in 2003. The federal government can get involved. Well, they can, they can sue and they can have consent decrees with uh, producers. And guess what? Premium Standard Farms got hit with a third wave, the federal government. And the, the uh, enforcement office had come out, the EPA enforcement office had come out with their little ban and their measuring tools and they measured downwind and they used also inside particulate matter data that from researchers back then, we didn't have much, but they used that to justify a notice of violation in air and water. And uh, so premium, premium standard farms had to pay a penalty. They had to do monitoring of their lagoons and barns and they had to test an abatement technology that both parties agreed with and that was soybean oil sprinkling. And they came and hit Buckeye egg farms too. Uh, EPA monitored ammonia downwind of uh, the, the layer houses and they saw that, yeah, the ammonia is uh, causing harm. They felt like it was high enough to cause harm to the neighbors. And some brief summer tests, uh, they did some stack tests on a, on a fan. Uh, this is an outside contractor from someplace. And uh, they saw that their potential to emit, they calculated to be 700 tons per year. So based on that, it was totally on air issues. Um, it, a big penalty, and they had to test their barns. They had to bring their ammo ammonia down to 50% of what it was. And they also had to bring their part particulate matter. They had to show that they were under 250 tons per year. It took four years uh, to, to, to finally uh, satisfy the consent decrees requirements. Okay, now let's go through some of the different compounds uh, concerned with air quality. Ammonia, and we heard about that. Um, here are some of the symptoms. We haven't heard about that yet. The odor can be detected around 5 ppm, give or take, depending on who's smelling, because everybody's a little different. Your eyes burn at about 20 ppm. Um, Typical levels though in a livestock building will be less than 50, but that, that's typical, it depends on where you're at. Um, downwind levels are usually less than a PPM and it can convert to nitrous oxide and it can also combine with NOx to form PM 2.5. So therefore ammonia could someday become a precursor to a Clean Air Act criteria pollutant. It is reduced by drying solid manure and maybe adding manure, some manure amendments to uh, wet manure. So going to the name study, we, we monitored ammonia at all the sites, but here's an example from the Oklahoma swine site. This is a sow farm with a couple gestation houses and the farrowing houses. And here is an example of the ammonia measurements over a period of two years. And we can see the diurnal or the seasonal patterns there. And we were getting around, you know, six to 16 PPM is on the high end throughout the year. Whereas in a layer facility, much higher than that, typically much higher than that. And in a dairy facilities, we got much lower than that. So that kind of gives you an idea. Hydrogen sulfide, that also comes from manure. The odor threshold in our olfactometry lab, we could determine that the panel of sniffers could, determine, could detect the difference between one PPB at a one, one PPB, whether um, they could detect it, barely detect it. But it's not annoying at that point. See, the annoyance level is more around 10 to 30 PPB. So it's a local concern because of the strong odor. Now, someone mentioned, how do you measure odor? Hydrogen sulfide is, is often used as we just sh sh were shown to assess odor um, because it's, it's gonna be a surrogate. There's hydrogen sulfide coming out of the swine farm here. And, and you can see here that uh, we're around 500 PPB hydrogen sulfide in the winter time and 
much about 100 ppb in the, in the summertime. And then the emission rate is shown there. Now the layer site, uh, what about the layer site, hydrant sulfide? This is a, a layer site with drying tunnel, uh, drying tunnels and a manure shed. So our concentrations were in the layer high rise, you know, 50, 100 ppb, and then most a lot of times less than 50. And at the Wisconsin dairy site, uh, I showed this slide this morning, but this is a cross flow dairy freestall. It used to be naturally ventilated. And just before we did the study, they put natural mechanical ventilation in there. And the hydrogen sulfide went away when they quit flushing and uh, started scraping. Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is an air quality parameter and it's produced by combustion equipment, uh, power washing with, a, with an engine uh, with, for power. And you get these symptoms. And I got a call one day as an extension specialist. I, I felt like a doctor. The guy was calling me and telling me all these symptoms he was having. I pulled down my air quality book and I think, uh oh, what are you doing? And he said, I was power washing my building. And, and he, his heart was throbbing in his chest and his, he barely crawled out of the barn and, and his worker uh, was still out there. So he went, went and got him out. And uh, anyway, the summer fans were off. There were some winter fans still running a little bit and that probably saved their lives because they barely made it out of there. But a carbon monoxide monitor would have warned them of that danger. Methane, methane, we know, we know methane is a greenhouse gas, but it also is 23 times, has, has 23 times the global warming potential of CO2. But it, it can explode when it gets up to really high concentration. So it is a safety hazard, especially in a covered manure storage situation. Well, um, well, the maximum allowable is 1,000. It explodes at 50,000, and you get a headache at 500,000. But if it, it explodes, you get a headache. And so there was a, a methane explosion. Uh, this was a partial pit, and the producer had covered it with concrete, put a manhole cover in there, but he had to do some repairs. And so uh, he, he started welding and blew it up. And this is the whole pit blown up because the methane was too high inside the pit. I invited him to speak at a safety seminar, so, but he did survive that, but he hit the roof. Nitrous oxide, it's colorless, non-toxic gas with a faint sweet odor. It's used in the medical industry, obviously when we go to the dentist. And the atmospheric concentration is about 335 ppb. Now here are the emissions at the Wisconsin dairy farm. And you can see that when they were doing a silage operations, Right in here, I thought I had it labeled there. This is silage operation, so nitrous oxide comes from silage. Particulate matter. We, we see that we have various compounds in the livestock uh, dust, and there's all kinds of things in it. And um, we can measure it with a, with a TOM. We have measured it. And uh, this shows one of our early measurements. And you could tell when the lights come on and the lights go off, you can. This is another behavior aspect of, of layer hens. And then when the lights are off, they hardly emit anything. And we also use these TOMs to uh, test soybean oil sprinkling, as I mentioned. And, and this is the control barn. This is the treated barn right there. 65% reduction. Odor nuisance. We use the FIDO method. Frequency, intensity, duration, and offensiveness. And you, we already learned how to do some of those things. But the lab olfactometer is typically used for source concentrations and the field olfactometer is typically used for downwind concentrations. And then odor intensity, um, we can just, you can just say categorically what it smells like, but then you can also mix up N-butanol in water to get a reference scale. And the hedonic tone, yes, we've already heard about that, so I don't need to go, I can skip this slide. Site selection. Isolating the facility will really help with the odor impact. There are some models out there. Universities did the developed uh, offset, uh, the odor for footprint tool, the livestock odor dispersion model, or some, some of them, including the uh, Purdue odor setback line, which I know more, most about my graduate students and, and I have uh, worked on this over the last couple of decades. 
And it, it includes all these factors you put into the model. And if you look at the output of this model against finishing hogs, against um, regulatory setbacks, these are, this is Iowa, Illinois, and South Dakota. Now you can see the political inputs uh, to the setbacks, right? And here's an example. This is my last slide. Um, this is an example of a campground where a 0.55 miles away, a large odor uh, swine finishing operation was going to go in. And so they protested that. I think, they, I mean, it was a kind of a lawsuit there. And, and, and I applied my model to it. And sure enough, um, using high land use as if this was a city because there's someone there 24 seven all, all throughout the year. 0.55 miles. So it, it, this odor setback said, hey, you're right on the borderline. If you put some biofiltration on the fans, you, you can bring it in like this. So that, that's, that's kind of how the, the model can be used. It's not perfect. It is a guideline. In summary, air quality issues are complex. They involve multiple pollutants. Producers have failed, have faced citizens' lawsuits, state regulations and litigation, and federal regulations and litigation. The isolation of facilities may be the least expensive method to control odor nuisance, and setback guidelines are available to help site facilities. So questions for Dr. Heber about the air quality issues. So is covering a lagoon the only way to reduce odor? From a lagoon? Well, yeah, from the lagoon. There are other other ways that can help. Uh, you can separate solids before the the manure goes into the lagoon to lower the loading rate. Yeah, that's one thing you can do. Um, there are things you can put into the lagoon, but you know I, we we don't know if that really works. The, the amendments that you can put into the lagoon, but lowering the load loading rate is another one. I mean, you, you can make your lagoon larger. Um, that that would that will help. Let me see what other things can be done. I mean, there's different ways to cover it. Uh, the, the, the one thing that's being done around the country is to cover the lagoon with a non-permeable membrane and then suck the air out of that, underneath that non-permeable membrane and run it through a biofilter. Low airflow, I mean, it's high concentration. You know, at one time we got a sample from underneath that one of those covers and oh my goodness, it, I think it took an hour to purge the olfactometer. <laughs> it was so strong, but uh, but then run that through a biofilter and, 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 and that, that is, or use the methane, use the methane. And that's actually what's being used out, out there in, in the country, different places. Any more questions? Um, with the uh, use of the setback models, um, have like, like newer uh, barns that have been um, like developed or expanded, have they had more success with like fewer lawsuits or, um, are there other issues that um, make up the lawsuit, I guess, if that makes sense. So the question is with the advances to uh, technology for building buildings and handling manure, have there been less lawsuits? Yeah. I, I really can't answer that because I'd have to do a survey. Uh, one thing I could say is that there are continuing to be lawsuits involving modern um, livestock facilities uh, using the latest technology. Whether those are justified or not, but there are laws. I can say that for sure.